My name is John Hornsby, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, I um, have a company called John Hornsby Creative. I'm not a web designer. I'm probably one of the least web savvy people in this building right now. Um, my background is more in um, print design, art and illustration, environmental design, scenic art production. Uh, I did a lot of signs and graphics, special events design, and things like that. Um, you will get a copy of the slide deck at the end, so if you want to take notes, you can, but um, the slides have a lot of information in them, so you probably don't really need to take notes if you don't want to. Um, and I do want to have it be somewhat interactive. Um, and so first, if I could just get like a show of hands, like who, who is here because they like self-identify as being an introvert? That's okay, that's pretty much everybody, so no surprise there. Um, what about um, designers? How many people in here are designers? All right, okay. What about like developers? All right. Um, what, anything else? Is somebody in here that doesn't fit into one of those? Sales. Who here is in sales? Okay. You all should have your hands up because everybody's in sales, um, even though we may not realize it or like it or want to admit it. Um, uh, I'm hoping that um, today I'll be able to help empower and elevate you all to get out and engage more in the world. Um, if you happen to catch Cody's talk or Aisha's talk or Judy, there's some similarities there, but I have some um, unique uh, content as well, so um, I think it dovetails nicely. If you're interested in this, definitely go check out the videos of their talks, too. Um, I already did that. Who's here? Okay. Who, you can mentally in your mind pick which of these avatars you identify with as uh, being part of your personality. Um, so, quick overview. Um, just going to go over a little bit who I am and uh, how to think about sales and customer service. Um, Going to talk about the stages of a sales cycle, a little bit about what to do when, um, some common challenges and solutions, um, understanding personal styles, and there may be some time for Q&A. I'm going to try and move through kind of quick because I probably tried to fit too much in. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about that, m the moments of anticipation of when something is about to happen and we're scared and nervous. Um, this happens a lot, and for most of my life, um, in moments like the one up to and including right now, um, <laughs> were a source of the sort of paralyzing anxiety for me. There's like um, an actual like physiological response where I would just be so nervous and afraid that I couldn't, I couldn't take that next step. Um, and for me, basically, fear was like this chasm that I just couldn't cross. You know, I could see what was on the other side of it, and there were things over there I wanted, but I was just too scared to cross that pit in front of me. Um, and I just want to talk about fear for a moment in that at a certain point I got to where I realized that I was just letting so many professional opportunities slip me by, um, chances at relationships, um, intimacy, you know, all these things that were there for the taking if I would just reach out and take them, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Um, at a certain point, you know, I looked at myself like, I, something has to change here. What, what can I do about it? And fear is like, I sort of think of it as like I'm walking through life and there's kind of like this monster on my back um, of fear. And it's with me wherever I go. And sometimes it's small and little and I don't even notice it's there. 
And then I go to do something, and it kind of reaches out in front of me and says, stop, don't do that. Um, and you can't ever really get rid of it. Like, there's no, there's no overcoming fear. It's not like this battle of good versus evil, and somehow good wins in the end, and like, the bad guy goes away. Um, it's there for the journey, and you have to learn to be with it, and you have to learn to take it out and really look at it and examine what it is that's holding you back. And most of the things that we avoid doing is because that's painful and uncomfortable, and we don't want to be uncomfortable. And our fear can control us to a point where it's not allowing us to live the lives that we want to live. It's not allowing us to really bring out our true, authentic self. So I just want to encourage you to like make a commitment to yourself to really like take that out and sit with it and look, with, look at it. And it's uncomfortable. And... But if you honestly sit there and look at it, you can start to identify and name the things that you're afraid of. Um, you know, for me, I have this need to be in control, and I'm afraid of situations where I'm not in control. Um, and so something like sales was as far from my comfort zone as I could get because it's like this wild card situation. It's one thing to, like, um, sit around with my friends and talk, but to like go meet a stranger and try and talk to them about some product or service, there's like all of these things that um, I don't have control over and that scare me. Um, the other thing is just I, was insecu I have insecurity. Um, you know, if I really want to like dig, dig down through the onion layers, I... There's some part of me that thinks maybe I don't deserve to be loved. And until you really start bringing that stuff out and looking at it, you can't really move through it. You know, you can't put it down and leave it. You have to learn to take it with you and move through it. Um, and so I want to talk about I'm not going to tell you too much about like my accomplishments and so forth, what I've done. I want to talk to you more about like who I am. So, you know, back in the day, I didn't understand how to connect. I didn't fit in really with any of my peer groups. I was kind of a self-isolating loner. I didn't enjoy large group events. Um, unless I had a job to do, I just need to be busy. If you give me something to do, then, you know, I have a purpose. I have something else to do, and I don't have to talk to people necessarily. So usually, you know, it, I often still get involved in events like this and have a, a job to do. So I've learned to leverage my needs and my fears to propel myself outside of my comfort zone, like I'm doing right now. Uh, you know, I have a job to do here, and it's a job that would have terrified me 20 years ago, but... Um, over time, I've learned how to get more and more outside of my comfort zone and become more comfortable being uncomfortable. So, I still don't care much for small talk. Um, I prefer meaningful, deep, honest conversations. I still don't care for sleazy, fake personalities. And I'm not here to convince you to adopt anything that is not true to you. But... I do want to challenge you to think about, is your sense of identity, you know, I put up those little avatars earlier, and maybe you're like, oh, I'm the wizard, I'm the uh, hero. But is that really your best self? You know, your sense of identity that you have created for yourself, that we all do as we come up from childhood into adulthood, be authentic to yourself, but also look at where are you using that as almost more of a shield to hide behind to consider where you might be holding yourself back? Now, what I'm trying to share here today is some of how I was able to find my true authentic self up 
preface this by saying it's an ongoing process. It's not like I've arrived and I've <laughs> totally conquered everything and all my problems are solved. Um, but I've made a commitment to go on this journey and have been work, working on it and continue to work on it. Um, so I was able to find my truer authentic self, not that identity I was using as a shield, to help evolve from being the introverted artist um, that I was to uh, being a top performing salesperson in some different companies that I've worked at. Um, I was able to grow from being this snarky, lousy communicator to someone who was able to professionally negotiate and manage teams, um, navigate difficult transactions, difficult customer service situations, and um, uh, you know, this is all done with help from a lot of mentors, you know, so definitely get out there and find people that you can connect with that can help you on this journey. Um, but they can only sort of show you the, the way. You have to be the one to walk through it. Um, so, you know, in the past 20 years, I've gone to being completely terrified of sales to being standing here today talking to you about it. So, you know, I believe that you can do this too in your own version of whatever that is. This may not be what you want to do, but um, if you're in this room, there's probably things that you want to do that you're not allowing yourself to do, I would guess. Um, so let's talk about sales and customer service in a dry clinical way. Sales is what you do between establishing contact with a potential client and closing a sale. Um, in a more feeling visionary way, sales is the vehicle by which you and your team can share your unique gifts and talents with the world. Without sales, you don't necessarily get the opportunity to do whatever your passion is, your work. If um, nobody's paying for it, it's harder to continue to be able to do that. Um, so what I want to focus on is more how you think about what you do and the why behind what you do more so than, you know, specifically do ABC. Does that make sense? I didn't mention before, but if you have questions at any time, you just feel free to let me know. Um, so there's a lot of different sales methodologies that exist out there. And I, at the end, I have a slide of resources, and I list some of them, and I encourage you to just go look at them and see what things might resonate with you. Um, a lot of the negative stereotypes we have are what's associated with, that, with what I think of as traditional sales. And, you know, it's like the used car salesman sort of um, mentality. What, what I've learned and, and focused on is more of a consultative style of selling. It's also called value-added sales. And um, as a very important part of that, customer service needs to be the cornerstone of the culture of the company that you work for, whether you're one person or a team of 100. Um, in order for all this to really work, customer service is a really critical component that everyone in your organization needs to be on board with. Um, so let's talk about some common myths of traditional sales. Um, one is that there's a magic bullet sales program that, you know, follow my program and you're going to be a million dollar salesperson in six months. It just doesn't work that way. Um, good sales technique is the key to sales. That's a myth. Uh, one and done training is all it takes to succeed. That's a myth. And being liked is most important. Also, not true. Here are what I've found to be some true facts of effective selling. That there is no magic bullet. Um, different situations require different scenarios. Um, different tools. So the more that you can learn about different skills and tools that you can sort of have at your disposal to use and when to use which tool where, you know, you got developers in the room, you got different tools and plugins that you use on your website, your sales process is like that too. If you try and use some widget for something that, you know, is not the function that it performs, it's not going to work. Um, Good sales technique d does give you an edge, but what's more important really is how you're perceived because our perceptions define our realities. And it doesn't, your technique is, good, is important, but 
if your potential client doesn't perceive you as being the solution to their problem, it doesn't matter how good your sales technique is. Training and learning are an ongoing journey. It's great to come to a camp like this on the weekend, and it's great to come to a talk like this, but you're not going to walk out of here and be magically transformed into a million dollar salesperson by sitting in a room for an hour. That's going to happen by you consistently working on it over time for your life. Um, and being liked is important, but trust is really the cornerstone of sales and business. There's plenty of people that I'm friends with, and I like them, but I'm not going to give them my money. <laughs> and uh, there's plenty of other people that I trust to do business with. I might not ask them to go out and have a beer tonight. Um, so, you know, if you're a jerk, you, and you, like, being like's important, you can't be like cantankerous um, and unlikable, but just being liked isn't going to necessarily make you successful in sales. So let's talk a little bit about defining objections and overcoming them. Um, in sales, you know, we talk about overcoming objections. That's basically, you know, you want to identify what's in the way of closing a sale, and whatever that is in the way, that's an objection. And it can be a simple thing like, how much does it cost? They're, they're, they're questions, they're not necessarily like, objections sound somewhat confrontational, but um, it's basically what information do they need to feel comfortable agreeing to purchase whatever you are selling. Um, and it's not necessarily technical information, it could be emotional information, and it might be about your company, it might be about your product or service, or it might be about you personally. Um, but before you can even get to that, we have to get past the general things that people don't like about salespeople. So here's where I want to like get some interaction here, make sure you're alive. So t give me some things that you don't like about salespeople, anybody. Pressure. Pressure. Don't like pressure. What else? Talk about themselves too much. Talk about themselves too much. Cologne. What is it? <laughs> Cologne, <laughs> offensive odors, okay? That's <laughs> that could be a problem in Asheville from the other spectrum, too. <laughs> what was that? Don't listen. Don't listen. All right, so that's, uh, there's no big surprises here. Here's, you know, ten common ones. They don't listen. They talk too much. They don't actually know what they're talking about. They don't follow up. They just outright lie. They don't understand my needs. They refuse to take no for an answer. Um, lack of authenticity. They've got that sleazy, smarmy, used car salesman, hey, how you doing, kind of thing. Um, lack of genuine interest in me. Um, and a lack of passion about what they're doing. If they're like, well, you know, here's, uh, I've got this thing, you want to buy it, maybe. Yeah. It doesn't get me ex too excited about wanting to do business with them. So, interesting statistic, only 13% of customers believe a salesperson can understand their needs. That's pretty abysmal outlook for being in sales. Oh, okay, so different questions, slightly different. Tell me, give me some things that you don't like about the idea of you being a salesperson. Not being knowledgeable enough. That's, that's a big one. Afraid to ask for the amount that I actually think something's worth, then afraid it'll run them off. Afraid to talk about the money part. Yep, okay. That's, that's a big one. That's, I struggle with that a lot. You seem like you have something to say. Just feeling fake. Feeling fake. Feeling fake. Um, provide an that, that you'll provide an insufficient, right, you're not actually going to fix their problem? Your solution's not good enough? Come off too pushy?
you get upset meeting that you get nervous or like uh, angry uh huh okay okay interesting so hmm what do you think's going on there Inter- <laughs> you feel like maybe like they're going to look down on you because they're maybe think they're better than you in a suit and you're you're showing up not in a suit i presume right you just yeah. It's that's been a challenge ever since college, actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Professor on the stage. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting you said that because well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so here's some some common answers to that question. I'm not a people person. I'm not extroverted. Don't like confrontation. I feel fake. Um, I don't know what to say or do, not qualified, educated enough, Um, if I don't believe in what I'm selling, I'm too busy, nobody said that, but that comes up a lot too, that's more of an excuse than a a version, but um, not good enough, maybe my product's not good enough, maybe I'm not good enough, maybe I'm not deserving of fear of success, fear of rejection, Um, these are all things that come into play in our own objections, and if we can't get past our own objections, how are we going to get past the customers? Um, So 55% of the people making their living in sales don't have the right skills to be successful. (laughs) So so think about that that for a second. More than half the people that work in sales don't actually have the skills to be able to do it. And um, so let's take a closer look at that. Here's my first tip. If you look like a salesperson, it's, it's game over. You know, all those things we just listed, everybody's got those in their mind. And if you, sh- if you show up, if you're my customer, if, to sort of turn that around, if you're my customer and I show up to you in a suit, I imagine that's probably also going to oh, yeah. be a disconnect. You're not even going to come in my office. Yeah. So, you know, I was here yesterday and looking around like, this is the first time I've ever given a presentation in a t-shirt because normally I'm like talking to like business people and so you know dress up a little more but I was you know for this crowd I think t-shirts the way to go I don't want to intimidate people and feel like I don't like you can't relate um, on that same note like it's not I'm not being inauthentic or disingenuous to wear a t-shirt or wear a suit like I own both and I'm not so attached to like my my uniform that I wear as part of my identity that I feel like I'm compromising myself to dress for the occasion. Um, so instead of being a salesperson, we need to become a trusted consultant. So let's look at how these differ. Um, consultative sales differently from traditional sales. Um, with consultative sales, we're really convincing someone in the increased value of our product and service rather than focusing on features and benefits, which is what traditional sales focuses on. You know, we have this product. It does A, B, C, D. Um, it's, you know, 10 times faster than the competitor, that sort of thing. Um, with consultative sales, we don't really use the features and benefits as the, as the lever. Um, we do, try not to appear as a sales rep or operate as a sales rep, but as a consultant. And, you know, I mentioned like how I'm dressed, but this is really more about how we behave and interact. Um, and it, you're really incorporating yourself. And throughout this, when I say you, I might mean you personally or your team, your company, but you're incorporating that into the value of your product. You gave a talk yesterday, it said people, cho- your customers, when you polled them, they chose to work with you because of your team. So, of course, you also have to have, you know, a good product and service, but what really sells people is you. Um, and the, the beauty of this is that if, if you want to, if you have like, maybe like more like a boutique agency or something, and you want to be able to charge more money, this is how you do it. Um, otherwise, the other alternative is like the race to the bottom on pricing, 
and you don't want to do that. Um, so as a consultant, we have to methodically flush out the implied needs and then formulate a solution that fits those needs. Um, and you have to be willing to walk away if it's not a fit. If it's not, if your solution isn't the right solution, move on. Um, so I just want to take a moment to talk about ethical integrity because that's what sort one of the like obstacles. You know, we sort of associate sales with like maybe taking advantage of people, selling them something they don't need. Um, so what I promote when I'm training sales teams is don't do that. You know. <laughs> Um, you want to identify when it's a win-win between the seller and buyer. So if your development is making a product that's excellent and you have excellent support and service and then you identify the right customers that are a fit for that, then it's a win-win. We're not trying to sell to people who aren't really our customers. Um, so if you, if you do that, then you can use with the right tools, you can overcome most objections. And if it's a win-win, it's the ethically right thing to do. You're not taking advantage of something. You're actually helping them to realize that you are solving their problem. So not all objections should be overcome, and not every sale should be closed. We should identify when it's a win-win and when it isn't. And if it isn't, we need to have ways of identifying that as soon as possible. So we're not wasting a bunch of time and energy, and then learn to concede or walk away gracefully and move on to the next potential client that is a good fit. So stages of the sales cycle, we're going to go through these, and um, this is in list form, but it is a cycle. And it's the stages of the sales cycle also are the stages of the customer service cycle and when you launch and when you um, follow up on the back end. And so these are listed out as sort of like steps on a path, but at the same time realize that not every step is necessarily linear and that this is sort of a cycle of um, continuing relationship. So the very first thing when you first meet that person Forget about selling. That's not what you're trying to do yet. We're trying to bond, build bonding and rapport. We're trying to build a relationship. We're trying to make a connection. Um, later, if we identify that they are a good fit for us and we're a good fit for them, then we're going to try and sell them something. But we're not doing that right now. So when you make that first contact with the customer, don't even try to sell them anything. You want to focus on building like and trust. Don't focus on your quota. And this is where things get hard for salespeople because a lot of times you might have a quota. You have to, you know, somebody's leaning on you to make, whether it's yourself, like I have my own business and, you know, every five minutes my five-year-old daughter is walking up to me and saying, I'm hungry. <laughs> so, you know, I need to like be bringing in some money. <laughs> but if that's what I'm focusing on, that's going to lead me to like do things like be pushy and so forth. So you have to build in there's a little bit of discipline to like not let that fear be the driving factor on every step. So look the part, don't look like a sales rep, and whatever that is, you know, today I decided to wear a t-shirt, when I go and meet with executives, I have on nicer pants and a button-down shirt. I'm looking the part for what that need is. Um, practice active listening and feeling feedback. You have to be sincere, and you can't fake that. You know, the swarmy thing is like people trying to fake it. You just have to cultivate it. Um, avoid, avoid typical small talk. You can just ask people about their business. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, so, I mean, this is one, what I was about to say is, get them talking about themselves. So, I want to, and as introverts, we have an advantage here, right? Because, like, w I could um, stand up here and probably have a staring contest with you for an hour and win if I wanted to, <laughs> um, and we could all just, like, sit here silently. 
Uh, that is actually a valuable tool that you can use to uh, extract information and to um, create that bonding experience because people like to talk about themselves. So if you um, just start asking them, you know, don't worry about selling, just start asking them about their business or their family or whatever, but business is going to give you information that's going to help with the selling part. Um, and, you know, you get them talking about themselves. And we'll get into this a little more. There are, like, little magic phrases and things that I use. One, one of them, I'll tell you now, is just tell me more. You know, so somebody starts talking and then they stop. Uh, okay, well, you told me, um, you know, you're having trouble with this problem on your website. It's not loading fast enough. Tell me more about that. Um, and just get them talking and listen, and then um, demonstrate that you've listened by, like, repeating back to them, not parroting, but, like, uh, you know, in a different way. Say, so what I'm hearing is that you're losing money because your website's loading too slow. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, okay, well, maybe tell me more about that. Um, <laughs> if you don't do this effectively, you won't be able to ask hard questions and make hard calls later. This step's the most important because later, inevitably, something's going to come up that's going to be a problem in your process. And if you haven't um, made a good bond at the beginning, you're not going to be able to push back or make, tell them something that they don't want to hear. But if you do a good job on this, I could say all kinds of, and, and the next stage is, I could say all kinds of things down the road that I would never be able to say like you can to a friend. Um, you know, sometimes a friend might tell you, you're acting like an idiot. What, is, what are you thinking? You know, you can't do that to a customer, but you kind of can if you do all this stuff right. Um, and it takes practice. And I've lost my screen. There we go. Okay. So a couple more things on that. So you build trust by making promises and then suddenly drawing attention to the fact that you've made a promise. So you don't want to make promises that you can't keep, but some people take that to not making promises at all. And so um, it helps to build trust when you sort of create scenarios where you can make a promise and then keep it. So find little ways to promise things that you can deliver on. It could be as simple as like, you know, after this meeting, I'm going to go back to my desk, I'm going to send you an email recapping what we talked about. And then when I send that email, first, after I say, you know, hey, Joe, or whatever, my first words are, as promised, here's that follow-up email. And it's just subtly showing them that he said he, was gonna, he made a promise, he kept it, that's like one drop in the trust bucket. And we want to fill up that bucket. Um, when something goes wrong, that's like a drop in the no, no trust bucket. <laughs> I don't know about this one. And, you know, it, in any situation, we're like putting things in both of those buckets. And we want to get that trust bucket full and the other one fuller than the mistake bucket. Um, I have this thing, I, like, I don't know, remember where I got this from, but uh, m avoid mutual mystifications. Does anybody want to guess what a mutual mystification is? What's the problem? I don't know. Like back and forth, not knowing what's going on? Yeah, es essentially, um, yeah, it's where neither of you know exactly what you're talking about. And we all use these all the time. Uh, for example, you know, a simple one, I'll call you later. When's later? In the customer's mind, later might be 10 minutes. In my mind, later might be 10 days. And if I told the customer, I'll call you later about this, and they're thinking 10 minutes, and I'm thinking 10 days, when I call them in five days, they're going to be like, what the hell took you so long? And I'm thinking everything's great. So there's lots of things that, that come up like that that we don't really think about. We just kind of take for granted. So you want to start thinking about those and avoiding them. And the, this is red flags and processes a lot. We get mutual mystifications from our clients a lot. Um, you know, a good one is um, when it, it, maybe I've talked to a client and um, we get to the point where I'm going to send them a proposal. And they say, okay, um, send over your proposal. If it looks good, me and my partner are sign off on it, send it back. Well, what does looks good mean? 
I have ideas of what it might mean. I need to know what they think looks good means. And you're not going to know unless you ask. What does looks good mean to you? Tell me more. <laughs> Get to, <laughs> um, you want to communicate. You want to over-communicate. And um, there's something that I call communicating info when I have no info. And that's basically giving them a follow-up even if you don't have anything to report. Sometimes we tend to wait. Like, you know, OK, I'll get back to you later. Um, as soon, or I'll get back to you as soon as I find out. You know, uh, I need to talk to my developer and find out about implementing that you know, functionality you want in your website. Um, as soon as I hear back from them, I'll let you know. Well, as soon as I hear back from them, it's one of those mutual mystifications. And then if it takes, you know, however long to get an answer, the customer's like irate level may be going up, up, up because they thought you were going to get back to them in 30 minutes and it's been days. So instead you might say, let me find out about that. I'll give you a call tomorrow at 1 o'clock and let you know where I'm at. And then if you don't have an answer, give them a call at like 12.55, not 1.05, and say, hey, I, we, we talked yesterday. I told you I was going to give you a call. Um, unfortunately, I still don't have the answer, but I want you to know I'm working on it. So let me uh, call, give you a call. If I don't hear something sooner, I'll give you a call back this time tomorrow. Now you're setting clear expectations. There's no mutual mystifications. And you're communicating, even though you might not have the answer, it's just more things in that trust bucket. Um, and then you have to learn to ask the questions that you fear the answer of. Um, you know, and a lot of, it may be just as simple as um, who else are you considering to work with on this project instead of us? Why would you choose to work with them instead of me? Things like that that you kind of are afraid to ask because the answer might be rejection. Um, you have to learn to start asking those questions. There's a, um, one of the things I think of is like, if you feel it, say it. Like we, you kind of, kind of get this gut feeling that maybe there's, I don't know, I've, I've, this has happened to me where I kind of like know like somehow in my gut, I know there's something going on. I'm probably not going to get this job, but I just like keep hoping that maybe it's going to work out. And so when you feel that, just say it. Um, now, how you say it's important. <laughs> um, and one of the things, again, just to build trust and make you appear like a consultant instead of a salesperson, at the first meeting, I might say something like, is, you know, once we get through this, is it okay if I say that I can't help you? Because then I'm not trying to sell, I don't seem like I'm trying to sell them something. And if it's not the right fit, I may say, okay, well, you know what, maybe you should, here's, here's another person that I know and trust it's going to be a better fit, I think you should go call them. Um, but if you kind of lead with that, is it OK if I say I can't help you, that helps sort of break down that barrier of like, OK, well, this person's not trying to shove something down my throat. So we want to establish upfront agreements, which is setting those clear expectations. So you know, before every meeting, make sure you're clear on time and place. What's the purpose of the meeting? What's the client's agenda? What's your agenda? What would a successful outcome look like? A lot of times if I go and meet with a client, you know, once we do like the initial small talk stuff, I might say, so you know, what do you want to get out of this meeting today? What would you like to walk away with at the end of this meeting? Okay, so now I have a, we're eliminating some of those mutual mystifications of like, where you might end up walking away from a meeting and being like, I'm not really sure how that went, or worse, like, I think it went really great, but I, it actually is not. Um, so be clear on these things. And then we want to work to uncover issues and concerns. And this is where things can get kind of tricky. And so even if you've done a good job on this trust thing, customers are still not going to want to give you all the information that you really need to be able to determine What's a good solution for them? You kind of have to be able to pull it out of them, some more than others. Um, so we want to kind of uncover what's really going on behind what they say is the problem. Because we all know a lot of times a customer might come in and state, you know, I'm here because I need this thing. And you get talking to them and you realize, well, you know, like in my line of work, 
um, it might be like, oh, I need a logo. And you get into it like, well, okay, well, you need a logo, you need a website, you need branding, you need a marketing plan, you know, all these things. Um, but that they're not going to come in and reveal that necessarily. So what I like to do is like ask them, like, what is the problem, essentially? I might not say it so <coughs> bluntly as that, but we want to get to, like, what, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? That's where I used to tell me more. So you, you ask them, um, go and meet with a client, and, you know, what do you want to accomplish today? Well, um, start a new business, and I need a logo. Okay, well, um, tell me more about that. Well, you know, I'm going to be... Um, my business is we're selling hot dogs on the side of the road, and um, I've got uh, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, thinking that um, you know we'll like let people know on Facebook where we are every day, and um, um, you know as they're talking, I'm thinking okay, logo, hot dog stand by the side of the road, schedule on Facebook, so you you're going to let people know on Facebook where you're at every day. Tell me more about that. You go through each item methodically and get them to tell you more. And as you do that, you'll uncover more information that may be of use for you to understand a deeper understanding of their need and how you might be able to provide a solution. So then, this is where we do kind of mess with our emotions a little bit. Um, but it's for the greater good. <laughs> um, so I ask him things like, well, how long has this been an issue? Um, well, we need a problem instead of like I'm starting a business. Okay, my website's slow. How long has this been an issue? Well, it's been about six months or so. Oh, okay, what have you done about it? Um, well, um, I hired this one guy, but then he like took a bunch of money and never heard from him again, and my site's you know, not really any faster. Um, did it work? Obviously, no. So what we're doing is we're kind of finding that pain, and then we're just kind of poking at it a little to, br to bring their attention to it to help them realize the value of a solution. Because a lot of times, we tend to undervalue the solution. So you're kind of just having them relive the, the pain a little bit, not to like you know, manipulate them in a bad way, but just to bring their awareness to the value of what you have to offer them. You know, so might ask them things like, well, what happens if, I don't, if you don't fix it? Well, I'm like losing like $10,000 a month. Okay, so now we know they're losing $10,000 a month. Surely it's not out of line to expect them to maybe pay $10,000 to fix that problem when they're losing that every month if they don't fix it. That's where we get to the money. Um, you have to find out what the budget is. And everybody has one, but no one wants to share it. And most of the time they say, I don't have a budget. Um, so there's a couple things I do there to try and get to that. Um, use what's called a start stop to ask. So what that sounds like is, um, I'll say, so, OK, we know what we're talking about doing. How much money, you know, what's your ideal budget for this project? Now, before you answer, let me tell you why I'm asking. We can design, you know, a, a basic solution that'll do these three things, and that might be five thousand dollars. Or we have this premium solution that does all the bells and whistles, and that's twenty thousand know, dollars. Where do you think you might want to be in that? And they might, at that point, you could you can start to kind of. You, it's called bracketing to try and get them. So they might say, I don't have a budget. And you might say, well, would you spend $20,000 on this? And you know, if their jaw hits the floor, you know that that's like out of range. And well, with like 10 to 15, does that seem like it's your comfort zone? You know, you lead them like, well, how about this? How about that? And eventually they'll say, yeah, OK, well, yeah, 5,000 is really where I was thinking I would, would be. You know, from there you might say, you know, depending on what you have to offer, okay, well, we can do something for 5000 It won't be, you know, as nice as what we could do for 7500 but um, we can look at that. And, you know, usually you can get them to 
do something a little more than what they say if you are bringing value to it. You know, offer them what they ask for, but then maybe also have an upgrade that they might consider or might go for if it is really a value. Again, if it's not a good fit, don't do any of this stuff. Um, decision. So here we get to sort of making the decision. Here you want to review everything that's been covered, gather your information. At this point, now we're at the point where we're really moving towards like selling. Um, you, we're either going to disqualify them, determine what you need to qualify them, or qualify them. Uh, qualification points are basically, uh, am I talking to the right person? Does this person even have the authority to like, sign on the contract? Or are they like, a runner for someone else and I need to really be talking to them? How do we maybe try and get a seat at the table to talk to them? Do they have the budget? You know, once you have that budget talk, maybe it just doesn't work. You might have to say, you know, I'm sorry, but you only have $2,000. I really can't do anything of value for less than five. So um, you know, maybe here's some other options. Or if you, you know, manage to rework your budget and, and figure out where that money might come from, I'd love to work with you. If not, you might not be a good fit. Um, and then viability. Um, is, is time, these are other factors like timeline. There might be like some sort of regulation compliance or something that could make it like the project isn't viable. Uh, even if they have the budget and want to work with you, maybe they're trying to like do something that's not legal or um, it just isn't allowed for some other reason. My background's in sign, so it would be permitting is where we'd run into that. Um, Fulfillment presentation. So now you've got all the critical info you need. You've uncovered their pain, their budget parameters, access to who the decision makers are. Then craft your presentation and make sure it checks all of those boxes. Deliver it to them and then actually ask them for the job. A lot of times we send out a proposal and then just kind of wait and hope. Um, we don't want to ask because they might say no. So you need to. Um, ask for the job. Um, you might say, is there any reason you wouldn't be willing to sign off on this proposal once I send it over? It's just another pass of like, are there, are there any more objections in here that I haven't uncovered yet? Because um, a lot of times those last minute sort of buyer's remorse ones come up. They're like about to sign and then they're like, if there's anything that you've missed, it's going to start kind of niggling in their brain. Um, So you want to try and counteract that buyer's remorse. You want to make sure all your, your, your questions and concerns are addressed. Make sure your proposal is a perfect fit. Invite them. And then a lot of times I'll add in there at that point when I send over the proposal, maybe just a little icing on the cake. You know, I, you know, I always do my due diligence before I sign off on anything. I invite you. Here's a couple names and numbers of some other people that we've worked with. I invite you to call them and ask them about their experience before you commit to working with us. Obviously, hopefully you've cultivated some of those and you've talked to them and said, do you mind if I use you as a referral to my customers? Even better if they're like prominent, you know, um, impressive clients that you can point to and say, um, you know, I, I, I can say, you know, uh, I've got the marketing director at Mana Food Bank. I've done a bunch of work for them and, um, Here's Kara's number. Give her a call if you want to ask her about her experience working with me. Because I know she's going to be a champion for me. She's going to say, yeah, John's awesome. You should definitely do it. And then you got your customers selling for you instead of you. Um, you, want to you can still lose it at this stage to the competition. And that's, again, where I just ask them directly, are you talking to anyone else? Is there something about their proposal that you like better than ours? If so, maybe give us a chance to take a look at that. Um, and then you want to continue to set up those upfront agreements about what the next steps look like. So you talk through them what, what happens next. You know, here's the proposal. So what's going to happen next? You just sign off on that, email it back to me, pay us our 50% deposit, then we're going to schedule our kickoff meeting. We're going to get together with the team, talk through developing the plan. From there, we'll put together the timeline of what your project's going to look like. 
and uh, work forward from there. So they can sort of envision themselves going through the process. There's not that. They also might have that fear I talked about at the beginning uh, when they're about to sign on the dotted line. Well, I'm not really sure what's going to happen next. I don't, I'm giving up control of a part of my business. So you want to alleviate all of their fear as well. And then, of course, at the back end, go back and ask for referrals. I didn't put it in the deck, but there's a statistic like, I believe it's like 44% of businesses say they would give referrals um, to you, but only 4% of us ask for them. Um, or maybe it's 8%. Um, so ask for referrals. If it, it close to the um, end of the project, once they've signed off on things, you know they're happy. Obviously, if something's gone wrong and they're not happy, you probably don't want to ask them. But if, uh, if, they're, if things are good, you know that they're, gonna, um, that they're happy about working with you, then I go through these kind of questions with them. Are you happy how I handled this project? Um, no matter what they say, I'll probably say, oh, I'm not surprised. What could I have done differently? Because if they're happy, it sounds a little cocky, but, you know, hey, people like working with me. That's, that's what I do. Um, if they're not happy, I'm also not surprised because we've been through that process together and we both know that something went wrong. And so I'm not surprised to hear you're disappointed. Thank you for telling me. Um, <laughs> what would you have had me do differently? Whether I did good or bad, maybe there's something I could have done better. Would you mind sharing a testimonial that we can use in our marketing? Um, do you know anyone that might benefit from our services? And if so, do you mind making an introduction? Even better. like. Give me a name and number is great, but you know, for an introvert like me, you find the ways to like make it easier. Like, if you will like maybe take me out to coffee with your colleague that also needs what I offer, and help help me make that introduction. That's a heck of a lot easier than like cold calling them, even if they give me the number. So maybe you know they can make a warm introduction for you and make that easier you know, as an introvert to then reach out, okay, well, their friend is recommending them. It's easier to make that phone call then. So let's move on to, how, how am I on time? Because I, I know I'm trying to cram too much in. Six minutes. Six minutes. All right. Would you rather, would you, I, I don't have time for it all. So would you rather go through how to handle an irate customer or would you rather look at, um, identifying different personality types and how to deal with them. Okay. All right. So, and uh, you know, the, the slide deck's available, so we won't be able to get to the last part, but just go to the, everything's in there. You can just read through it. Um, all right. Handling irate customers. So, here's how this goes. Real quick, I'll just share that I had a job, my wife and I. Um, we did a, this mobile marketing tour where we were driving an RV around the country for a health insurance company, and we were setting up, it was when Medicare Part D was rolling out, and we would go to different cities, and we'd set up in Walmart parking lots. It's probably okay to say that I was at Walmart, um, but I won't mention the insurance company. And we um, set up booths, and basically it was kind of like, come on in and learn about it, and then we, there were insurance agents that came, and we'd help bring people in. So. I don't know about you all, but who here loves their health insurance company? Anybody? Uh, so <laughs> most, most of the people that came into that tent came in in an irate state. They were coming in because they were mad because their insurance company had screwed them over in some way. And, you know, I've dealt with a lot of health insurance issues, and I don't like them. Um, so first, just listen. Let them get it out. Listen to the complaint. Don't ever argue with them. It's not going to get you anywhere. Doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Um, and you need to really empathize with their experience and take their side. Never say, I know how you feel, because you don't. And when people say that to me, it kind of just ticks me off. That's just me personally. You don't know how I feel. Um, but instead, you can say things like, I understand how that would upset you, or... I see how you can feel upset about that. If that happened to me, I would probably feel the same way. And you're letting them get it out, and you're 
not being confrontational, and you're allowing it to kind of diffuse. And then you want to show concern and an urgency to resolve the problem. And you want to assure, what I would typically advocate is assure the customer that a solution is at hand, but don't rush to just offer the solution that comes to mind. Um, because a couple of reasons. One, you want to like protect yourself and your company too, and not necessarily give away the farm if you don't have to. And two, because you're going to be having an emotional response to this, and you're not going to be thinking as clearly either. And when you hang up the phone, you're probably going to be like, oh man, I wish I had said this and said, or why did I agree to do that? So I would um, promise to make it a priority to resolve the issue. And then you might say something like, I understand your position. I definitely want to make sure we get this resolved for you. And I need to get with my team to make sure I can get the best resolution possible for you. Um, and I don't know exactly what that looks like yet, but I can promise you that I'm going to get this taken care of and we're going to walk away friends. And then I always, whenever I give like a solution like this, I always kind of ask at the end, like, well, in this case, I would ask them, like, what, what does a fair resolution look like to you? Because again, it's a mutual mystification thing. I might think that they need a full refund and give them everything back for them to be happy. Um, you know, I might think we need to give away the farm. They might only need an egg to make them happy. And, and I'm just assuming that they need this high level thing because I'm in this emotional state as well. So you find that out, and then you go back to your team, whatever it is. I mean, maybe it's just you, maybe you have a team, maybe you have a boss. Um, you're going to make a promise. You need to make good on that promise, and quickly. Um, so go work with your team. Find a reasonable solution that either matches the customer's re request or is an acceptable compromise that you think they might agree to um, that maybe protects you a little bit. Because sometimes maybe you're like, well, they're asking for this, but that's going to be pretty painful for us to give them everything they're asking for. Um, have a compromise of what you would like it, the solution to look like, but then also have a plan B of um, what you're willing to go to if they still are not happy with what you're offering. Um, so then call them back, uh, thank them again for bringing the issue to your attention and giving you the opportunity to resolve it because you know, the term customer service opportunity, we probably hear that a lot, but it really is an opportunity. If, if you've done something wrong, the customer could not say anything and just go to your competition. If they're bringing it up to you, um, and again, you've established this trust with them, it's because they want you, they want to come to a resolution with you. They don't necessarily want to go somewhere else yet, but if you don't handle it right, they're going to go somewhere else. So, Offer the resolution that you came up with, and then I always ask them, does that sound fair to you? And you're going to get feedback. Either they're going to say, yeah, yeah, that, that, that'll work for me, thanks for, or they're going to be like, no, that's not what I want. I want blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, it's not satisfactory. You already have a plan B in your pocket, but I would um, not offer it right away either. Because the other thing is you don't want to make everything look too easy um, because it lowers the value. And if you're going out of your way to resolve the problem, they're going to appreciate you that much more. So, you know, I might say, let me go back and I'll call you back in five minutes, come back with your plan B. You might have to repeat that process to get to a resolution. All right, I need to wrap up here. This is another thing that this actually came up through like um, a parenting thing, I think, using with kids. But this is magical in any relationship. It's, I call it the magic four-point apology. And it's, um, you basically say that I'm sorry that whatever it is happened. Um, I realized that it was wrong because name the pain that it caused them or the damage that it did to your relationship. In the future, Instead, this is how we're gonna, I'm going to handle this. What am I going to do differently next time? And then the magic part is you ask them to forgive you. And this will bring people to tears if you use it sometimes. 
and um, probably not customers, but like <laughs> I've I've made I've had my kids use this when they've done like something like to a grown up, and it's it fixes it. It totally fixes it. <laughs> now of course if you keep doing it, it's not going to keep working, but um, something like that comes in handy. So. I'm out of time. I, I'm sorry. I tried to put too much in. But um, all these slides are available, um, will be available on the website. So if you are interested in um, digging in a little deeper, uh, you can go um, there. And uh, they should be available soon. And um, that's my information. I encourage anyone uh, who wants to reach out and connect. I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know if we have time to answer them now, but I'll be around. And um, I also have like stickers and postcards and things. I do illustration work too. So if anybody wants any of those, you can come up and get them. So thank you.